and welcome back to the Common Connected Podcast. I'm your host, Janine Halloran, and today I get a chance to interview Dawn Hebner again. She is the award-winning author of 14 children's books that have sold over a million copies and have been translated into 23 different languages. And I get a chance to talk with her today about her new series. It's Dr. Dawn's many books about mighty fears. And it's fantastic. We talk a lot in this podcast about some different common fears that children experience and adults. Um, So we talk about the fear of throwing up, actually. We talk about the fear of bees, the fear of dogs. And we talk about things that families can do to help support the kids in their lives who are struggling with this. So I hope you enjoy our interview and take a listen. Oh, I'm so excited to have Dawn back on the podcast. Dawn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here because you have a new series that's out. I'm going to just show people the new series of books. They're so, so sweet. It is um, a mini series about mighty fears. So do you want to just chat a little bit about that? Sure, be happy to. So these books are called Dr. Dawn's mini books about mighty fears. Each one covers a specific childhood fear or phobia, and they're brief. So they're really user friendly, based on cognitive behavioral strategies for kids to learn to get on top of phobias and fears. Yeah, I, I had a chance to preview them and get a chance to look through them. It's perfect for those different those kids who are really struggling with specific phobias, you know, if you are really struggling with a child who has a phobia of say spiders or animals or throwing up, that's a huge one that people don't Mm -hmm. actually think about all that much, but throwing up is kind of a big deal for some kids and it's really anxiety provoking. So absolutely. These are fantastic. I, I was thinking about, I had a a teenage client a few years ago, and I I would have totally read the throwing up book with her. (laughs) Even though the books are meant for six to 10 year olds, but it's definitely the case that the concepts, the strategies are applicable across all ages. Absolutely. She was on the spectrum. So that's, you know, it was one of those things where I think she really would have um, enjoyed reading it, um, Mm -hmm. but it would have really helped her out just to go through those steps Um, and you know, it's, I like, you have a little bit of information in the back of the books for families and for clinicians as well. Like you don't have to read the whole book in one fell swoop. You can take it chunk by chunk by chunk to make it a little bit less intimidating for kids, even just like hiding the book and finding the book. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Just approaching it. Thanks. So one of the things that happens when kids are afraid is that parents begin to accommodate the fear right? And that's really common. And it comes absolutely from a place of love. You know, parents see their kids afraid of something and distressed about it and wanting to avoid that thing. And avoidance is definitely the easier thing to do. It's, it's what quiets fear the fastest, but it absolutely locks it into place. And so it's really important for parents and kids both to know what to do instead, because, you know, your gut is telling you stay away when you're afraid, but staying away turns out to not really be the right thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. So what are the things that you typically see in your practice that parents are doing that they shouldn't necessarily be doing? (laughs) Yeah. So the two biggest things are reassuring, overly reassuring. So um, kids who are afraid of something, you know, of trying something new, of um, health issues, of animals, seek reassurance. And it's fine to reassure an anxious child once or twice. Um, But when you get into a pattern of reassuring over and over and over again, or, or giving absolute guarantees that the thing the child is afraid of is not going to happen, that turns out to be problematic. Kids really get hooked on the guarantee, having a guarantee. And, you know, as we all know, that's impossible. We can't make guarantees about things. And then the other major mistake is accommodation of the fear, meaning fostering avoidance or, you know, if a child's afraid of dogs, avoiding places where you might encounter a dog, always putting yourself between the child and the dog, 
um, allowing your child to, you know, stay away from the dog. That's, that's called accommodation of the fear. Um, so accommodation is when a parent changes what they would otherwise do in an attempt to reduce the child's anxiety. And one of the things that's kind of counterintuitive is that this goes for all kinds of anxiety. When you're met with anxiety, the impulse is to try to reduce the anxiety right away. But that turns out to be counterproductive because when you're trying to reduce the anxiety, you're almost always accommodating it. And what you need to learn how to do instead is to move towards the thing you're afraid of. And you can do that in really small steps. Like this can be made manageable even for very, very phobic kids. Um, but you need to essentially change your relationship with your anxiety rather than running away from it or listening to it. And it dovetails really nicely with the work that you do with teaching kids how to calm themselves, which is a part of this. You know, you need to calm your brain and calm your body so that you can move towards the thing you're afraid of. Um, but the, the calming is kind of a midpoint rather than the goal in and of itself. Right, because you can't, I, it's always so interesting. You, it, it is the natural, normal thing. As a parent, you want to comfort, you want to reassure, you want to make it better. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to live through challenging feelings, challenging situations, challenging thoughts. And how do you do that? It, I, I agree. It's like you have to like sort of, you walk through it together, but we can't avoid, you can't avoid forever. You can't. Right. And then you just end up avoiding for life. <laughs> right. So I think it's really helpful for kids and even kids as young as five or six can be taught that something about their brain, you know, that we have kind of a command center, an, an alarm system within the brain that's always on the lookout for potential danger. And it's good that we have that. We need that kind of alarm system, but it sometimes makes mistakes. So an alarm goes off in our brain and we feel like we're in danger, but really we're safe. And that's a false alarm. When we respond to the alarm system every single time, as if it's the real deal, you know, there's an actual major danger there, the system stays broken. When instead we learn how to kind of sort out a real danger from a false alarm, and the way that we do that is by in small steps moving towards the thing that we're afraid of and seeing that even though we're afraid, nothing bad actually happens. That's what corrects that internal system and leads to profound and lasting change. And that's really the only thing that leads to lasting change, to, to correct the alarm system. Yeah. And so for families out there that are sort of like in this position where they have kids that are fearful of something, what do you think their first step would be? What would you recommend for them to do? So I think um, it's really important to think about things that you do outside the moment of fear. Right? So if you wait until the child is afraid, that's not a teaching time, right? We can't learn when we're in that high alert state. So outside the moment of the fear, I think it's important for parents to address whatever the fear is with their child when they're not, let's say they're afraid of bees, right? So you don't wait till you're outside and a child is panicking about, is there going to be a bee? You do it outside of that moment. And I think starting out talking about the brain, right? Your brain has a special part in it. It's always on the lookout for danger. When that part of your brain thinks that there might be a danger, even if it hasn't seen anything, but it just thinks there might be a danger, it sets off an alarm. And that's when you feel afraid, a brain alarm has gone off. But here's the thing. Sometimes that brain alarm goes off by mistake. And that's what's happening about, you know, if we're talking about bees, that's what's happening with bees with you. Every time you're outside, your brain alarm goes off and tells you there's going to be a bee, it's going to sting you, it's going to be horrible. That's your brain alarm, right? And if you listen to it, it strengthens it. It makes it so that that alarm's going to go off 
every time you're outside. And so what we need to do is we need to teach your brain alarm to be more active, more accurate. And there's a way to do that, right? So I think that parents can start out with kind of an overview of what's going on in the child's brain. And then to talk some about, we're going to make a plan and you need to start someplace that's realistic, right? So, you know, it's not just, um, bees aren't going to sting you. Don't be afraid. Like, you know, that's, <laughs> that's not going to work. Right. Um, so parents, uh, can work out a plan with their children and the books guide parents through doing that and children through doing that. And there are other resources to, to guide people do that, but it's essentially, um, doing what's called exposure, which is learning how to move in small steps towards the thing you're afraid of keeping yourself in the situation, talking to yourself so that you can manage it. And in a sequential, progressive, diligent way, practicing this. And the practice is really key, right? So, and that's another important piece that, you know, you don't, when you have a phobia, you don't wait for the trigger to happen. You court it. You, you kind of choreograph things so that the child is able to practice in small steps because yep. frequent practice is really key. Yeah. And I love in the books you talk about, you know, um, and I particularly um, remember in the throwing up book where you actually like write all these different words for throwing up. Right. where you get used to even just seeing the word and right. talking about it, saying it out loud, because then it becomes part of the everyday, like this is just part of our conversation. It's right. not something to avoid or deny or suppress. We are talking about it and then right. we can take the next step. Yeah, the fear of throwing up um, really nicely illustrates something that happens with lots of phobias, which is that um, the the fear or the thing that triggers the fear alarm begins to snowball. And so kids who are afraid of throwing up become reactive to anything that reminds them of throwing up. So the words associated with throwing up, um, the, the clothing that they were wearing the last time their stomach hurt or they threw up, the place where their siblings sat the last time that they were sick, the foods that were eaten, like, you know, there's this increasingly large world of things that um, are associated with throwing up that a child begins avoiding. And so it's in part of the step-by-step -step practice is building those things back in talking about throwing up, acting out, throwing up, listening to sounds associated with throwing up, doing art, you know, with, with uh, printed pictures of vomit that you get from the, from online. Um, and then starting to wear the clothing or eat the foods or, you know, it's kind of reintroducing all those things that have been avoided. Sometimes people think that um, exposure means making the child do the thing, the, the very thing that they're afraid of, right? And back when I went to graduate school, that was the understanding that for a child afraid of throwing up, you gave them syrup of Ipecac to make them vomit. Wow. That's not what's done anymore. Um, or, you know, for a child afraid of dogs, we're not going to like have the dog, the child get bitten by a dog. It's, it, it's not that, right? So it's all of the, um, these things that a child is avoiding, that's what you expose them to. So, you know, the, the clothing, the foods, the places associated with vomiting, the um, being around a dog in, you know, first a dog on a leash or watching dogs from afar, getting closer, starting to interact step by step by step, but you don't want the child to actually be bitten. That's, that's not the point. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think, you know, it's interesting to think about this sort of like on a continuum, like, you know, when you're watching your child and you're noticing that they might be a little bit more afraid of say bees or dogs or any of these sorts of things. How do you know when it's time to seek extra help, when it's time to seek a professional opinion about what's going on? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's, it's really when the fear is getting in the way, right? So it's normal for kids to be apprehensive about things. We actually want kids to have some amount of caution, right? Yep. Um, 
But when the fear or anxiety of any sort gets in the way of a child doing the things that, that really they want to do or things that other kids their age can easily do, that's when it's time to seek help. And there are great self-help resources, you know, my books and other books as well. And that's a perfectly reasonable place to start for families. Um, but if parents find that the self-help resources aren't enough, or if parents find that their own anxiety gets so triggered by their anxiety, their child's anxiety, that it's hard for them to be the calm and steady presence they need to be, then it can be really helpful to find a, a therapist to just kind of guide you. And there's no shame in that, you know, people that struggle with anxiety come by that innocently, right? Um, and anxiety often runs in families, so it's not unusual for an anxious child to have an anxious parent, right? Um, and also, parents are wired to protect their children. And so when a child is panicking, that's going to set off the danger alarm for the parent, right? And if the parent doesn't have the skill set, hasn't, hasn't been taught how to use the skills to keep themselves calm, then it absolutely makes sense to seek out a therapist who can just help everyone with changing their relationship with anxiety. I think that's brilliant. And I, I completely agree with you. It's very common when you see mm -hmm. an anxious kid, you've got usually at least one anxious parent. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it's very, it's very, very common. And sometimes they know, and sometimes they don't. And yeah. it's, it's interesting to walk through that with them and help them figure out, oh gosh, maybe I need a little bit more support myself right. because I'm right. really struggling around this. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, you can get support around that too. There's no shame in that. There's no yeah. shame in trying to just be a better person living in life, you know? Right. right. And, One of the things that's really important for both parents and kids is to learn how to just tolerate feeling anxious. Right? Yes. So anxiety is a really uncomfortable feeling. And when we feel it, we want to not feel it anymore. Right. But it's important to, you know, understand and get some experience with the fact that anxiety is uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous or it's not a sign of danger. It's a little bit like hunger, right? Like the early stages of hunger, super uncomfortable, but often, you know, if we go about our business, it fades. We don't have to be immediately responsive to it, right? Um, so it's like that. It's uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. And, and people can learn how to tolerate it more effectively, which ultimately reduces it. Yeah, I, yeah. I completely agree. And it feels like sometimes people feel like they want to just make it all go away. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, like with any feeling, you, you can't, it, it's not the best choice to try and make the feeling go away. You're going right. to feel the feeling, feel it and know that it will eventually stop feeling like that all the time. It's not a right. forever thing. That feeling is not forever. Right. Um, it's, it's so interesting. We've talked about um, a few phobias. Can you just share uh, the phobias that you are tend to see in your work? Yeah, so fear of throwing up, I would say is actually the most common fear that I treat. Um, animal fears are, are probably right up there as well. Dogs and bees are the, the most common. Um, fear of trying new things um, or making mistakes. Those often go together. Um, separation fears. There are lots, right? And a lot of these are considered like normal for children. But again, we're looking at to what extent does the fear interfere? Um, so, you know, a child can be afraid of something that's typical or atypical and um it's whether or not the, the fear is really getting in the way yeah that matters yeah yeah that's uh, thank you now do you have plans to write more mini books i do yeah oh my so goodness. um <laughs> these first four are about throwing up health trying new things and animals there are three more um, on the on the road, uh, I'm on the road to writing. One is about bad guys of various kinds, uh, baddies and villains. We're calling it um, separation and mistakes. Oh my so. goodness! Yeah, perfect. That's exactly what we need. <laughs> right. 
the separation anxiety that's actually what I see more of it typically um it's the separating from family and it's and that's been a little bit more challenging as COVID has happened because you spent so much time together so that like being in school phobia like to be able to like leave your family and go back to school or be around people in general (laughs) right right yeah because kids in over the past few years have gotten the message that people are dangerous yes you know because of germs Yep. And just being in the world is, you know, like just walking around in a store is suddenly like fraught with all sorts of anxiety, Um, walking, like being at a playground, being at a party, all of these things that were were normal and typical and expected before and suddenly became like scary. And now it's like, well, what do we do now? And how do we feel about it now? And I'm still feeling worried and anxious about going and being around my grandma. And what do I do? Right. Right. Yeah. And that's one of those places, you know, that circles back to remembering that being afraid is not the same as being in danger, right? Those are two different things. So being afraid is telling you pay attention, like there's something new here. Um, There might be something that you need to be cautious about, but it's not the same as actual danger, sort of clear and present danger. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So just a couple more things before we wrap up. I'm really enjoying our conversation. So if people were interested in getting the books, where should they go to purchase those? Wherever books are sold, they can be ordered. Um, So, you know, independent bookstores, your favorite online uh, bookseller, and there are links to my publisher who also sells them on my website. Fantastic. Yeah. And I'll link to all those in the show notes. And then my final question, as I always ask my guests, as you know, What is something that is recharging or relaxing for you? What are your coping skills? How do you deal with things when they get overwhelming? (laughs) I love to swim um, and I I do laps and I find it really meditative. Everything just sort of falls away while I'm stroking, stroking, stroking. So that's one of my go-to relaxation and and de-stressing strategies. Oh, that's lovely. I'm so thrilled for you. I do not have that. That for me is like super anxiety provoking, but I recognize that other people really enjoy swimming. So, (laughs) and to each his own, right? And you know, it's something we're all, we're all working on things. I'm a work in progress. That is one of my goals is actually to get better about my fear of water. Uh, Yeah. Um, So, um, Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And um, people can just go and check in my show notes and get all the information to find you. Great. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Great.